I also recognize that it's a passion of mine to connect people to Israel in kind of a very, not like a non-cynical way. Shani Zanesco, thank you so much for being on my show. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me with a huge list of remarkable people. I'll try oh, to thank you. The, the bar. Yeah, I'll try. To, I'll try. <laughs> I am extremely excited for this, for this conversation. Shani, besides the fact that you're the founder of Ezra Tech Ventures, which we'll, of course, dive into, I think uh, talking about your journey uh, is extremely relevant and interesting because like you mentioned right before we started talking, your entrance to the tech world as an Israeli is not the perhaps traditional, you know, startup nation, uh, you know, classic story of 8200, elite unit, whatever, and then going into the tech. Yeah, you had a, mul a multitude of really fascinating positions with embassies, with diplomats. So Shani, who are you? And then later on, we'll dive into uh, what Izzer Tech Ventures is about. Yeah. Well, I always like to start my story in a town called Fort Worth, Texas. <laughs> Yeah. Um, or really at the a Christian university. Yeah, but beforehand, uh, I guess it all begins with a dramatic day that my parents told me the worst thing that you can tell to a 15 year old living in Israel, surrounded with friends. I grew up in Misgav, which is like a kibbutz, like it's really the best place to live. Um, well, they have one of the best robotics team in Israel. Yes, that's true. Um, so it was very dramatic. I thought it was the end of the world for a teenager to say, hey, we're moving to Fort Worth, Texas. I had no idea what this place was. Um, and then, indeed, one thing led to another, and um, I was bumped at class. So I went straight into my senior year. Um, wow. And then started applying to colleges because this is what you do in the U.S., right? And I didn't really know English at the beginning. I didn't want to speak with everyone because I was angry, right? I was like, yeah. Um, but then I didn't have a choice. And I, the, the first happy thing was that I realized that I can get my license, driving license, before everyone else. So yes, uh, it was the first good sign. And then one thing led to another. And um I got into Texas Christian University, which is a private university. Um, and it was, I mean, it was su such a different experience than all of my other friends. And um, I mean, it was a great experience. Some of my best friends for life, obviously, were my roommates and yada, yada. Um, and then... Um, I, I had a choice, what, what should I do? Uh, because my parents went back to Israel. We were there on a relocation. So at the age of the 17, 17 I did my first intuitive decision. Um, I didn't know that it's called intuition back then. And it was to decide to stay by myself in Fort Worth, Texas to complete my degree because all of my family went back to Israel. Right. And I'm glad I did that. Um, I, I decided to also, another intuitive decision was to come back to Israel and still do my military service, even though I was 21, which is old uh, for military right. um, here. And so you finished your degree in the U.S. and then you came and you essentially volunteered or did your military service back in Israel? Did my regular military service. The only thing was my mind was wired. Like, you know, when you're about to graduate from college, they're like... You can do whatever you want. And I started sending my CV to places in the military, which no one does in Israel. Like, I right. faxed it. And then um, I, I ended up in the Foreign Affairs Unit. Uh, and then I decided that I want to be an ambassador. And, like, I want to connect people to Israel. And I want to do all these things and all, all that jazz. And so, What I was it about the experience in the Foreign Affairs Unit that made you say, I want to be an ambassador and I want to be a diplomat for now? I think that it was something that still accompanies me until this very day. And that is that it just feels like I'm a part of something bigger. And I know, I bet a lot of people say it to you, but 
this is for me the most one of the most um, like the strongest motives for me to do things. Like I, I like to be a part of something, uh, and over there it was kind of a daily thing that you're doing small stuff, but you know the repercussions of that. So it right. was very thrilling to me. Um, and then I, I also recognized that it's a passion of mine to connect people to Israel in kind of a ver- not like a non-cynical way. Um, because everyone around me was cynical about it, but I, I, it's like something I recognized there. Um, so I did the, the obvious thing that people in the foreign affairs unit do after they're done. And I moved again to the Netherlands, uh, to The Hague. And I was assistant defense at a share there. So I wow. did what, what I wanted to do. It was a great experience, but it was too cold. So I decided to, <laughs> to come back. But and, and honestly, it was kind of uh, lonely too. It's, it's a very lonely, um, it, it's lonely, to be honest. Um, and I also realized that I don't want to be an ambassador. No, and I'm guessing it's not just the location that is perhaps less lively than, you know, the city of Tel Aviv, which is one of the liveliest pe- places in the world. But it's also the fact that you're kind of alone there, right? I mean, you're leaving straight after the army. A lot of people go to the go to university together or move to Tel Aviv together. And if you're going uh, to a different place, obviously, yeah, I, I completely understand. Yeah. And everyone at the embassy were couples and families and, you know, it's just kind of like you kind of get the point of it. And I was already very independent. So I kind of like experienced, I traveled a lot around Europe, like I lived in the States. So at a very young age, I was already kind of just ticking the boxes on a lot of things that I wanted to do. Right. So I moved back to Israel and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I signed up for a master's degree, right? This is, <laughs> this is what of did course. Um, and then I started looking for a job and it was kind of like a culture shock. You know, it, it was interesting because I was coming back to my own country, but I was still experiencing all the culture shocks that I've heard that other right. people were. Like, I felt like an Ola almost. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Even though you served in the IDF, even though you grew up in a kibbutz, you felt like an Ola. Kind of, yeah, because you kind of need to rebuild your life again. Yeah. Um, and I had friends, and I'm very good at keeping touch with people, but there are a lot of struggles, and you, you do have more comfortable lives uh, if you live in Europe or in the U.S., I'm sure uh, you're aware. Um, and you kind of need to... Um, give up all the comfort things that are very obvious when you live abroad and not in Israel. So it's even in the small things and in your day-to-day stuff. And also I got back and I didn't know what I was doing with my life. And, you know, right, after I was right. like, bam, 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 I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And you're like, why everyone is saying to me I'm overqualified for jobs? Like, what the, what does it even mean? Like, you know, you're, you kind of start realizing that you need to do some work on yourself. And that was right. the point. Um, so talk to me a little bit about the, the transition from uh, diplomacy and foreign affairs to Israeli tech, because that sounds like a little odd transition, especially because it sounds like you did it. There was a point where you did it a little, a little bit abruptly. Yeah. Well, so when I got back, I, I started working at the British Council um, and I started as a project manager and I moved up to be the, the, the head of the department. And in this organization, um, they do collaborations with the UK on various of um, sectors. And one of the sectors is research and science and innovation. Mm-hmm. And I think that was for me like the gling, gling, gling when I, I realized that I'm kind of a nerd. Like, I'm, wow, like it's Science is amazing. Technology is like mind blowing. There are people who are doing amazing stuff. And this whole idea of continuing to promote Israel through tech kind of started there. Uh, So after three years there, I also managed uh, an innovation center. And I wasn't there for a very long time. But I think there, it was the first time in my life that I worked with entrepreneurs. And you speak to a lot of entrepreneurs, I'm assuming. So you know that that spark in their eye and that passion, it's something that is completely like it sucks you in, like you, you want to be yeah. around with people and you just, you, there's no way back. So from working with 
ministers and CEOs and high levels, which was, I still do that. It's great. But it, it didn't feel the same. So I left and like every good story, a friend of mine gave me a kick in the butt to come to one of the a delegation of uh, investors that wanted to be introduced to some startups. And it started from there. Um, and it just kind of happened naturally. I know it's not a good recipe or like something that people might be able to follow. But for me, the transition wasn't a one day that I decided that I'm going to do it. It wasn't a role. It was a very gradual process. And right. from meeting all these delegations that come to Israel and are craving meeting the best people, the best technologies, want to hear more about it. I also started doing um, consulting to uh, innovation programs and accelerators and hubs and all these angel investors wanted me to work with them. And then it really led me to work with one specific investor that I'm working with uh, also today uh, that is, again, doing something huge that is much bigger than me. So the transition is is was very gradual. It wasn't. But that you, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the, clearly, and you alluded a few times to this idea that helping Israel through tech <clears throat> and innovation, because you're coming from the foreign affairs uh, segment, and I'd love to to dive into this a little bit because I think it's it's really interesting. A lot of people are talking about Israel as a startup nation, and you know, innovation through necessity, and no place for small dreams, right? And I'm curious about the role on the diplomatic side and the foreign affairs side on on Israel being a startup nation. So, what 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 is the importance of that? And and give me a little bit of insight into the back seat of 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 the of the diplomacy scene. Well, <laughs> so I kind of I've kind of seen in in um, all sorts of angles. So. I've also seen, I've, I first saw it from the defense angle, okay? And there it's like, it sounds weird, but it's very safe. Israel is kind of like the go-to place for defense technologies, solutions. Right. Everyone wants to work with Israel, even if they're not admitting it. Right. Okay? And... It was very interesting to me because I saw how people, colleagues from all around the world are craving so much to work with Israel, but they're kind of afraid to do so. And I think yep. coming from the startups and technologies, it's a um, much more legitimate thing because people are just looking for solutions for X, Y, Z, and you know that they find it here. And I think what's interesting for me now and always was to be in this intersection of being the one who's either initiating or supporting or accompanying the collaborations and bringing in government because you you need all of you need everything so the government role the private money which is extremely important you can't really do anything you can have a lot of plans but you need the private money um, and all the other players, so the private sector, the public sector, some NGOs even. And I think for me, I was always in this intersection. And when I decided to go ahead on my own uh, freelance way with Israel Tech Venture, sure. uh, it was really from the purpose of kind of, um, kind of like shining this intersection and making it more accessible to people with the emphasis of bringing investments to all these amazing startups. And for me, that is the best service that I can do for my country to bring in that foreign money. So is that really what the goal of Ezratech is to bring in uh, partners across the seas from different cultures and different backgrounds to support Israeli tech and innovation? Yeah. So, you know, along the years, I really realized that I accumulated a network of I'm truly, I truly mean it. Remarkable people from all around the world. And in conversations, we always had this like, okay, so how do we begin? How do we start this collaborations? How do we, I know this investor, I know this minister, I know like, it was so like disorganized to me. Right. And I knew that I could just 
if I have my own platform, I'm like, I don't owe anything to anyone, really. I can just do sure. the great connections that I want to do. So to be honest, it's just a platform for me to play around and do whatever I love, which is to connect all these people who are very influential um, from all around the world and in the process support startups that I truly admire and truly love and kind of want an excuse to work with them to be right. honest. Yeah. That, 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 that sounds so, so cool. So give me a little bit of background about your experience right now with this. So what, what part of this really makes you, you know, really passionate about this on the day to day? Is it the meeting the startups? Is it the meeting the people outside of Israel and connecting, seeing the connections unfold? Because I'm guessing that a lot of the times the connections, while they're being made through Israel Tech Ventures, they, they expand much further than that, right? As they go on these longer term uh, collaborations. So yeah. w- which part of it do you get really excited about? So pre-COVID-19, <laughs> <laughs> we have two parts of the of the right. answer. Of so course. pre-COVID-19, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, I had these marathon days of meeting 10 startups a day and like boom, boom, boom. And sometimes it was very boring and sometimes exciting. I met so many people. It really like it's it's a certain energy that is can be really exhausting, but can really nurture you as well. Yeah. Depends on who you're meeting. Um, and I was working in a very, very quick um, pace. Nowadays, um, and, you know, I had all these dele- incoming delegations and come lecture here and come lecture there. It was a different vibe. And I just enjoyed the whole complex of that. Nowadays, I think what I enjoy most is to really work uh, with the companies, with the startups, um, so I am on some boards and uh, working with portfolio companies of the investor I'm working with. And it's really interesting to me to really dive into the company. And, you know, half of the time I'm only listening because I'm trying to understand how I can help them and not to jump and be like, hey, I connect you to this and this. It's like something that, you know, in Israel we love to do um, to really soak in where they are, what they need, and try to help them, again, by connecting them to both my network and uh, anything else that they need. Um, so I think for me, it's really some what I enjoy most now. And it's also a time when you really, you're kind of deepening every aspect of your life. So I think for me also at work, and you're just, everything is more calm. Sure. So I'm trying to enjoy it because the craziness will right. be, will return, right? We we know it will happen. A hundred percent, Shani. Twenty minutes go by very very fast, and I think it's 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 wonderful to hear about somebody's journey coming from outside of the tech world and and finding passion within it and finding the right foothold and making a really positive impact, not just on on entrepreneurs but also on the on the state of Israel as a whole. Uh, so thank you for that. But before we leave, I have to ask you for the most important question: three words that you would use to describe yourself. Well. <laughs> Last week, I learned a new word from a friend that I think really describes me and probably people already saw it because uh, you read people's energy. You can't really define them in words, right? So the word was vivacious. Okay. I didn't know this word. It's, you learn something new. And I think um, the second word would be a creator. Okay. And I think the last and most important word would be um, heart, wholehearted, heart led. I think it's it's what's uh, what, what what describes me the best. I love it, Shani. Tudaraba. Thank you very very much. Best of luck with Ezra Tech Ventures and all the wonderful work that you're doing. And I'm very excited to share this with the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Bye bye. Bye.